Hello everyone, my name is Casey Metherall. I'm an engineering manager for IPCO. My presentation today is on sulfur drum granulation with a focus on the various issues that have troubled drum granulator operations for decades. And I'm going to do this by talking about the SG20, which is the latest model of drum technology offered by IPCO. The SG20 is a scaled down version of the larger SG30. What we've been able to do with this design is demonstrate everything that we've learned and improved on over previous designs. The end goal here is to solve all the problems that can make an operator's life difficult when operating a drum. So here's the agenda, but I won't consume too much time on this. I'll just give a brief overview of the SG20 and the process in general, and then we'll get right into the common issues we have with drum granulators. First, a quick refresher. A sulfur drum granulator is used to convert liquid sulfur into solid sulfur granules. We do this by introducing tiny sulfur seeds into the front end of the drum, and then we use flights inside the drum to pick up those seeds and drop them in front of a liquid sulfur spray hitter. And we do this over and over to coat the seeds until they become granules and are discharged from the drum. So I'll just give you a few specs here on the SG20. The forming capacity is between 400 and 800 metric tons per day. It's a single pass process, which means the sulfur only passes through the drum once, meaning there's no recycle conveyors and no vibrating screens. We generate those tiny seeds I mentioned uh, external to the drum as opposed to inside the drum. The process availability is greater than 98%, which is the highest of any drum granulator ever. And we have a number that high because of how we manage uh, the issues that I'm going to be discussing in this presentation. Our drum is at a zero degree angle, so it is completely level, which provides advantages for installation and maintenance. Our dust control is by a wet scrubber using a Venturi and the material that we capture in the wet scrubber, the scrubber catch, is recycled as opposed to sending it to a melter. This picture gives an overview of the process, which is the same for all sizes of Ipco granulators. We have three inputs, the liquid sulfur, the water, and the air. So the liquid sulfur is pumped into the seed generation system to make those tiny seeds. And then we convey those uh, tiny seeds into the drum where we're also pumping liquid sulfur to spray it uh, into the drum and coat those tiny seeds to build them up into granules. At the same time, we're pumping water into the drum to provide evaporative cooling. And we're also pumping water into the seed tank just to maintain the level of water in that tank. And as we evaporate water inside the granulation drum, we are passing air through the drum in order to remove that water vapor. And that leaves us with two outputs from the granulation drum. We have solid sulfur granules, which are being discharged onto a conveyor, and those go off to storage. And then we have a hot, humid airflow coming out of the drum, which contains sulfur dust. And because it contains sulfur dust, we have to put it into a wet scrubber to remove that dust, which we send back to the seed tank. And the exhaust air, which has been cleaned up, goes to atmosphere. Let's talk about the issues that operators have with their drums so we can talk about what can be done about these issues. The first and biggest reason that conventional drum operations are limited to short run times, and by that I mean less than 24 hours, is because of buildups. When you're running a drum granulator, you're spraying liquid sulfur. And when you do that, you create tiny droplets that get suspended in the airflow. And when these droplets come into contact with the surface, they solidify and create a buildup. And over time, these buildups will impact capacity and they'll impact product quality. So they lead to shutdowns. And there are various areas where these buildups occur. For instance, inside the drum, they can you can get buildups on the flights, on the sulfur and water headers, on the breachings, which are the covers uh, on the ends of the drum, or in the ducting downstream of the drum uh, where you're sending the air to uh, a scrubbing system. And that ducting is what I want to talk about in a little bit more detail. So the picture that you see on the left is air ducting that has a very high level of buildup. And the picture on the right 
right, so it shows a relatively clean air duct. So the one on the left is obviously a problem because when you have that level of buildup, you have a drastic reduction in the airflow that you can put through the system. And when you limit the airflow through the drum, you limit how much water you can evaporate in the drum, which affects the amount of cooling that you can have inside the drum. And when you limit the cooling, your temperatures go up and left long enough, you can create a very big mess in the drum by overheating. So that's something that has to be avoided, which is why um, these, systems, these systems have to be shut down to do cleanouts. So there are various factors that um, affect the rate of buildup. And we've been watching this for years. We've been studying this to figure out what we can do to eliminate or at least mitigate the rate of buildup in various points of the system. And we've definitely had some success with this um, because now instead of having to shut down once or twice every day, um, we can run these units for a week straight without having to shut down. And I should say approximately one week because it really depends how you run the system. So if you run it correctly, you can get over one week. Uh, if you um, are not running under optimal conditions, then you can um, operate for less than a week before you need to shut down. So you might ask, how do you run uh, under optimal conditions? Well, let's talk about that. Running a conventional drum granulator is actually quite difficult. There are a lot of process variables that need to be considered. Some of these can be measured on a continuous basis, like the inlet air temperature and humidity, the liquid sulfur flow, the liquid sulfur temperature. But then there are others that cannot be measured easily because instruments put into that point of the system would foul very quickly. Uh, for instance, anything put into the airstream where you have hot, humid, and dusty air. But to run a drum granulator properly, uh, you need to know how much air and how much water you're putting through the process. And you need to be able to compensate for all the applicable variables to know how the water and airflow rates should change over time because you need to be able to compensate for changing conditions like night to day or season to season, or if you have a varying sulfur temperature at your inlet. And it's not realistic for an operator to be able to think about all these variables at the same time and understand how to compensate for the, uh, the changes in the required water and airflow rates. And this has left operators with two options. One, they can do trial and error until they find a sweet spot and that may only last for a few hours before conditions change again. Or option two is to settle for suboptimal operating conditions where they're either making off-spec product uh, or getting accelerated buildups or both, um, which will lead to shutdowns. So we looked at this and, and decided there must be a better way to do it. And we were right, uh, there is a better way. We created a process simulation that takes into account uh, all the variables that we are measuring. And we use formulas based on empirical data to uh, account for the other variables that we're not measuring. And this allows the operator to know um, how much water and how much air they should be putting into the system. So we call this an operator guidance system where the operator can just plug in their variables and then they get the outputs uh, for recommended uh, water and uh, airflow adjustments. And this works really well and it makes operating a drum granulator much easier. So this is a huge improvement. If you've ever spent time operating a drum granulator, it's almost guaranteed that you've had to deal with plugged sulfur spray nozzles. 
And these nozzles will plug off in one of two ways. The first way is with solid contaminants that are in the liquid sulfur, where a solid contaminant will get lodged in the orifice of the nozzle and plug it off. And for this, the solution is always filtration. The second way that sulfur nozzles get plugged off is by maintaining them at a temperature that's lower than the melting point of sulfur so about 115 degrees celsius so these are cold nozzles and that's actually what you see in the picture on the left which is an older design of ours that maintained the nozzle tip at a relatively low temperature so these are very prone to plugging with solidified sulfur so we wanted to find a good solution for this because attempts have been made in the past, but they always come with major trade-offs. So we wanted to find an efficient way to do this where we're only using low pressure steam. So we're not overheating the sulfur header, but we're still keeping the nozzle tip hot. And this is what we're able to do. And I can't tell you exactly how we did it, but what we have are hot nozzle tips that are not prone to freezing with uh, solidified sulfur. So this is a big deal because a single plug nozzle is going to cause problems. It can create buildups in the system, it can create off-spec product, and it will lead to shutdowns. So by maintaining the sulfur temperature nozzles at a high temperature, we, um, we reduce the probability of a shutdown. Here you can see a rotating drum. It's a very heavy piece of equipment that is sitting on steel rollers. And there are very high forces involved at this interface between the tires on the drum and the steel rollers. So a proper alignment is required to avoid premature wear uh, at this interface. And neglecting to do so is going to cause you problems, which will lead to the need for repairs and replacement of various components. And any of these issues will get accelerated when you place your drum at an angle. And this is done to use gravity to move the granules from the inlet down to the discharge. So this is something we're able to mitigate because we've actually made our drum completely level. So a zero degree angle. And we use advancing flights in the drum to move the granules from the inlet to the discharge. So this drastically reduces the risk of causing damage to your rollers by a misalignment. And it makes installation very easy. And this is nothing new for IPCO. We've been doing this uh, since the start, but uh, it's worked very well. So it's something we carried forward uh, into the SG20 design. And this did require some experimentation to get the flight angles um, correct for the smaller size drum, but it is certainly worth the effort. Let's talk about sulfur dust emissions now. And I'll start with a bit of background. Every drum granulator is going to have an exhaust airflow that has a high concentration of sulfur dust in it. And a scrubbing system is essential to reduce the concentration of this dust down to a reasonable level so it can be, so the air can be re, uh, released to atmosphere. And there have always been two options for dealing with the dust. The first is a steam jacketed cyclone, which uses centrifugal force to uh, move the dust particles up against the wall of the cyclone where uh, the steam jacket will melt the sulfur and allow it to drain down. But there's two trade-offs with this type of system because it is a very simple system but the the problems come down to efficiency. Um, the first is particle capture efficiency. So a steam jacketed cyclone is going to have higher emissions because you are melting sulfur inside the cyclone and creating sulfur vapor, which becomes dust. So it's very difficult to get a low level of, well, it's impossible to get a low level of emissions out of a cyclone. The second issue is the high level of steam consumption because you're passing the entire airflow of the drum through the cyclone and you're heating up that entire airflow using the steam jacket on the cyclone. So you have very high steam consumption. So energy efficiency takes a hit with that type of system. The second type of sulfur dust control that we have is the Venturi style wet scrubber. So in this type of system, we're circulating water into a Venturi to capture the dust and, and clean up the airstream. And I'll just show a couple videos to help visualize this. So the video in the bottom right shows the Venturi. This is the point where the water is interacting with the airstream to grab those dust particles and remove them from the airstream. 
And then from the bottom of the wet scrubber, you have a waste stream, which is water and sulfur dust. And this water will be sent to a settling tank. And you'll notice the color of the water is yellow, and that's because of the sulfur dust content in it. And when it goes to a settling tank, um, this gives uh, the water time to settle out the dust um, to, uh, so you're sending clean water back to the wet scrubber. And in a typical or a conventional system, your settling tank uh, leaves you with a sludge of sulfur with a very high level uh, of water in it. Uh, and this sludge needs to be sent to a melting system. But this is where we've differentiated ourselves because instead of sending this sludge to a melter, we're actually reusing this sulfur dust in our process because our settling tank and our seed generation system are the same piece of equipment. So any dust that settles out of our waste stream from the scrubber is actually becoming seed that's recycled back into the process. So we have no, no melter involved, we're just recycling the seed back into the process. And this is a very uh, unique feature of our technology. No one else is doing this. While we're on the topic of emissions, let's also talk about hydrogen sulfide, which is almost always present in liquid sulfur. When you put liquid sulfur through a forming system, you are releasing some of that H2S into the airstream. And depending on the concentration of H2S and the specific requirements of the environmental permit at a given facility, you may or may not need an H2S scrubbing system. Uh, and th this is what you can see in the picture here, is an H2S scrubbing system bolted onto an SG20. On the positive side, these H2S scrubbing systems can be sized for almost any H2S limit, and they have a relatively small footprint. On the negative side, when you're bolting on extra equipment, you're adding to the costs of your forming facility. And you also have chemical, chemical consumption and waste disposable to think about. In most facilities, H2S scrubbing is not required, but if you have a high H2S content in your sulfur, or if you have a very low limit on your environmental permit for hydrogen sulfide, you may need to deal with this. So on the left is a picture of the SG20 in Italy, and this has an H2S scrubbing system bolted onto the back end of it so we can meet the environmental permit. And on the right is a picture of three more SG20s being installed in Oman. But at this particular location, H2S scrubbing is not required. So now I'll just provide a summary of the work that we've been doing to mitigate the common issues with sulfur drum granulators. So the first is sulfur buildups. So here we've mitigated buildups in the system, which allows us to increase the availability by reducing the amount of time that operators spend with the system shut down to do cleanouts. And we're also reducing the impact on product quality. The next issue is ease of operation. So drum granulators have conventionally been very difficult to operate, but now with the use of a process simulation, we're making it very easy for the operator to make adjustments. The issue of frozen sulfur nozzles in the drum spray header has now been completely eliminated with our new heating system. Uh, on the topic of drum installation and maintenance, we've made this much easier by using a design with a completely leveled drum on the topic of sulfur dust emissions, we are using a wet scrubber, which gives us the lowest possible emissions for sulfur dust. But at the same time, we've taken care of that trade-off of dealing with the scrubber catch. And to do this, we are recycling uh, that dust back into our seed generation system to use a seed. And then the last issue to solve is H2S emissions. And for this, we've found a bolt-on solution that can go onto the end of any drum granulation system. That concludes my presentation on sulfur drum granulation. I'll leave you with this slow motion video of granules falling onto a conveyor belt in slow motion. I hope it's given everyone a clearer picture of what's going on inside a sulfur drum granulator. This type of solidification has been around for a really long time, but as you can see, there's still a lot we can improve on. And if you're interested in seeing granules falling onto a conveyor in real life, let me know and we'll arrange a visit to Sicily. Thank you very much for your time.